Today we'll cover The Dressmaker by Rosalie Hamm and we'll be looking into a summary and some of the themes and if you stay until the end of this video I'll make sure to link you to more resources where you can learn with more themes but also I'll give you sample essay topics and a sample essay topic breakdown that you can go away and practice with. Throughout the examples in this video I'll make sure to link them to real life modern examples so that you understand why you're studying the text because we don't want to just be studying English for English sake I want you guys to actually understand how this is relevant to you and why it's important for you. It also makes things a lot easier to understand, makes English more interesting and helps you enjoy your studies more. Hey guys, welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Lisa. I was a shoddy English student turned A plus student turned pharmacist turned entrepreneur. So on this channel, we talk about all things to help you score better marks in English, but also life advice so that you can be equipped going out into the adult world. Let's get started. Summary. Now, just as a warning, you probably already know this if you've read the text, but this text does deal with sexual assault and rape. If you're sensitive to these issues or you have a friend who might be struggling with the topics in this text, I'll make sure to link you to a few resources that can help with supporting you or them as you're studying. The Dressmaker is an acclaimed novel by Rosalie Hamm, which is based in the fictional 1950s Australian country town, Dungata. It is a novel which is profound at the best of times and disturbing at the worst, elucidating the horrendous power of hate to drive division into the heart of isolated communities. One might leave Hamm's novel with an essentially pessimistic view of human nature. It is clear that, in the author's estimation, a happy ending or deus ex machina is not worth our time. And by the way, if there are any words that are new vocabulary for you throughout this video, make sure you write them down, get that pen ready, so that you can save them for your essay writing later. There's a hot tip for you. But just make sure that you do understand these words rather than just throwing an M to make you sound good, okay? The novel's narrator is Myrtle Tilly Dunnage, who, as an adult woman, makes the venture to her hometown of Dungata to care for her ill mother Molly after she fails to return her cause. This foregrounds some of the plot's main points about false accusations and persecutions. Ham reveals to the readership that, at the tender age of 10, Tilly was sent away due to a false accusation that she murdered her childhood tormentor, Stuart Pediman. Even though the community acts as if Pediman was an angelic child, Ham makes it explicit that he was a disgusting, obnoxious individual who delighted in sexually assaulting Tilly. Pediman ultimately met his fate while attempting to bully Tilly snapping his neck against a wall as he ran at her. Despite the material facts of the case, his parents, Evan and Marigold, blame Tilly and slander the 10-year-old as a willful murderer. As a result, Sergeant Farrett, Dungata's policeman, arranged for Tilly to be sent to a Melbourne boarding school. Although the novel does not provide extensive detail regarding Tilly's time away from Dungata, the reader is crucially made aware that she became an accomplished dressmaker under the tutelage of Madeleine Vianette in Paris. Okay, I'm just being fancy there and saying Paris rather than Paris, but anyways. Tilly occupies her time caring for her increasingly mentally and physically ill mother, whose house has fallen into disrepair. After cleaning the house, Tilly sets up her sewing machine once more, the most tangible expression of her affiliation with haute couture and fashion. Sparking an intimate friendship with Teddy McSweeney, the son of Dungata's poorest family, Tilly once more begins associating with the township, which precipitates another predictable cycle of rumor, suspicion, murder, and division. At the footballer's dance, Tilly comes face to face with Dungata's lingering resentment for Pediman's death as the townspeople engage in slanderous gossip and refuse to make her acquaintance or publicly acknowledge her presence. Pretty mean people, right? However, after hand making a beautiful wedding dress for Gertrude Pratt, the townspeople reluctantly acknowledge both Tilly's skills and provide a market for Tilly's booming dressmaking trade across Dungata. Essentially, the people are not willing to forgive Tilly, but the allure of outwardly presenting class and identity, whether it be Pratt at her wedding, Farrick cross-dressing, or the Pettymans reinforcing their wealth, trumps all else. However, 
with the accidental death of McSweeney, who leaps into the sorghum silo and suffocates, Dungata retreats into its natural divisions. Its people shun Tilly and cruelly assign her blame for the accidental death, which she truthfully attempted to prevent. However, Ham paints a complex picture of Tilly as a fundamentally different individual from the impressionable 10-year-old who was once forcefully sent away from Dungata. She rejects a conciliatory approach and instead plays a pivotal role in forcing the township to come face to face with its classist divisions and hysteria. As such, Marigold Pettyman murders Councilman. Evan, after learning both the truth about her son's death and that her husband had been drugging and sexually abusing her throughout the marriage. It's a somber ending to the story of Dungata's wealthy citizens. More than that, it illuminates the reality that behind every story of success lies a deeply disturbing underbelly, that being the hidden and unpleasant elements of one's life. Molly Dunlinch also passes away, the town's chemist drowns under suspicious circumstances, and infamous town gossip is placed in critical condition. Whew, that's quite a bit, huh? With a district inspector coming to investigate the town's woes, and Tilly branching her business to neighbouring towns, Dungata is finally open to disinfecting light out of the outside world. However, Tilly is not content with merely exposing Dungata's faults, and instead engineers a plan to enact her vengeance by suggesting that the townswomen and men either participate or watch a performance of Shakespeare's Macbeth in a neighbouring town. With the town deserted, Tilly's following actions are those befitting of a Shakespearean tragedy. She douses the town in petrol, sets it alight, and takes only her sewing machine as she leaves the wreckage on the train. The dressmaker's end is utterly disturbing, yet it also reflects decades of internalised pain, trauma and vilification being enacted on a town which has been rotten to the core. Ultimately, Ham presents a pessimistic contention that renewal is not possible and that the destruction of what is impure is preferable. Let's talk about themes. Isolation and modernization. One of the central conflicts in The Dressmaker is between the isolated town of Dungata and the rapidly modernizing surroundings of post-depression 1950s Australia. Ham uses this dichotomy, meaning when two opposing factors are placed right next to each other, to question whether isolated communities like Dungata really have a role in the modern world. Our clearest indication that Dungata is not only traditionalistic, but absolutely reviles change and outside influence, is right at the start of the novel, when a train conductor laments that there is naught that's poetic about damn progress. Here, we see the overriding contention of Rosalie Ham's novel, that because a community like Dungata has been isolated for so long, it has become absolutely committed to maintaining its traditionalism at all costs. Costs. There are more symbolic reflections of how stagnant the town has become, such as the fact that Evan Pediman, the town's elected councillor, has been in a role for multiple decades without fail. Or that the same teacher who ostracised Tilly as a child, Prudence Dim, is in charge of the town school. I want to pose a question to you now. Have you ever met anybody who has been stagnant? Or have you watched any TV shows or movies where this same representation exists? where a person has been stuck in one area for so long that no change has happened. Keep in mind that for humans, change can be often met with fear. Change is uncomfortable. And on the other hand, sticking with what you know is comfortable. It's safe. This explains why Tilly's arrival was so terrifying for the townspeople. Fundamentally, Tilly Dunnage represents a breadth of worldly experience which these backwards people know they cannot match. It's important to remember that Tilly never actually antagonizes Dungata's townspeople, but rather that it's her mere presence that they find so disturbing. This might seem a bit confusing at first, but when we remember just how isolated Dungata truly is, it becomes a lot clearer. Tilly and her extravagant style is not solely a threat because it changes the fashion scene in Dungata, but also because of its symbolism. Here, Dungata is dealing with an empowered woman who runs a business independent of any man, single-handedly revitalizing the town's culture and social scene. You would think that Dungata would be broadly thankful, right? Or at least tolerate Tilly's presence because of the benefits she brings to town. But unfortunately not. Here, we can really start to see why Ham despises town like Dungata. 
Through this thematic lens, the death of Teddy McSweeney and Tilly's later ostracization shouldn't seem like a freak accident anymore. The townspeople were always looking for an excuse to label Tilly as a murderer and a witch, and when they got the chance, they absolutely latched on. As such, it's abundantly evident that the very nature of Dungata is shaped by this isolationist rejection of queer ideas being any idea from the outside world, and that it is simply impossible for modernization to ever take place. So, when Tilly eventually brings about the dramatic finale to the dressmaker, raising Dungata to the ground, we shouldn't see this purely as an act of revenge. On a more metaphorical level, this is Rosalie Ham communicating her authorial intention or authorial message that isolation and modernization cannot coexist and that Dungata was always doomed to fail. All it took was one spark from Tilly for the town to burst into flames. So now you can see the clear division with people who don't want to change versus the people who are willing to accept change and to modernize themselves. Think about this in your own life. Where have you seen examples of this happen? Before we move into the next theme, I want to also point you to a few resources that you might find helpful, where I cover more themes, including femininity, fashion, and patriarchy. And over there, you will also find sample essay topics and a sample essay topic breakdown for you to go away and practice with. Now, if that's not enough for you and you find my teaching helpful, then you also really like my The Dressmaker Study Guide. I worked with Jordan, who achieved a perfect study score in English, and he wrote up five essay topics based on the free sample essay topics given on the blog, fully annotated so you know exactly what you need to do and what you shouldn't do when it comes to your own essay writing. Through the annotations, you see into the mind of somebody who has done well and succeeded in English. Hopefully you can emulate some of these advice in your own journey as well. Let's now talk about social class. The dressmaker speaks extensively about social class. By class, what I mean is the economic and social divisions which determine where people sit in society. For instance, we could say that the British royals are upper class, whilst people living paycheck to paycheck and struggling to get by are lower class. Now that we have a basic understanding of class, it's also important to introduce the notion of a classist society. A classist society is one where all social relations are built on these affirmationed economic and social divides. In other words, Everything you do in life and everything you are able to do is built on where you sit in the class structure. For the dressmaker, the question then becomes, how does class relate to Dungata? Well, Dungata is one of the most classist societies around, where societal worth is explicitly based on one's position in the class structure. Let's take two examples to flesh this out and really substantiate the presence of class divide. Take a family like the Beaumonts, who are Dungata's aristocrats, basically people at the top with old money. The Beaumonts are absolutely obsessed with their own class position, to the point where Sergeant Ferrat sarcastically remarks that Elizabeth Beaumont considers herself very refined and above the rest of Dungata. At the top of Salem's class structure, the Beaumonts do little more than frill about and judge other people. But that's the point of class in itself. It consigns those as a bottom to a fate of difficulty and hardship, whereas those at the top receive a life of pleasure and privilege. In the same way that the townspeople treat the McSweeney's as if they're naturally at the bottom of the heap, the Beaumonts get the same style of treatment, as if they naturally deserve to be at the top. The Pratts laugh at their daughter Gertrude when she tries her hand at getting the attention of William Beaumont, stating that they don't have a chance in the world at unloading Gertrude, least of all to William Beaumont. The curious thing here is that, out of the two families, the Pratts, who own the town's general store, are actually a lot wealthier. So how do we explain that? if Dungata is a classist society. I'm glad you asked. This is why it's important to remember that we're talking about social class. And in a nutshell, what that means is that class is not solely based on how much a family may or may not have, but who they are, who they know, and what other people think of them. Class is just as much about perception as it is about the actual wealth itself. And when perceptions are so deeply ingrained in Dungata, it's almost impossible to move between classes and advance to the top of the ranks. Right on the other end of the scale, the McSweeney's are the absolute bottom of society and live in relative poverty, meaning that 
Although they survive, their conditions are worse than that of than the majority of Dungata. In a literal rubbish tip, apart from the name McSweeney alluding to how they're seen as swine pigs, which are dirty and unwelcome in polite society, the townspeople reinforce their position at the bottom of the class structure by treating their poverty as if it was natural. For instance, even though Teddy McSweeney is a much loved member of Dungata's prized AFL team, women in Dungata refuse to date him because he's still a McSweeney. The fact the fact that Tilly and Teddy end up in an albeit short relationship is also based on class. Why? Because Teddy, as someone who has experienced ostracization alongside his family his entire life, is one of the only people who didn't believe in Tilly's curse, and thus becomes one of the only people in town willing to give Tilly a proper chance. Woo, that was quite a bit. Now I'm going to direct you to a playlist where you can have a watch of my essay structure tips, my essay writing tips, because that's probably going to be the next stage of your learning journey. I hope you found this video helpful, and make sure you go ahead and watch those videos so that you can continue learning more. Thanks so much for watching guys and I'll see you next time. Bye!